dear colleagues, uh, we are starting now first uh, respiratory school RITA, respiratory intensive therapy in English and in Russian also with inter interpretation. We'll have a translation and I would like to introduce our uh, new topic. It will be technical aspects of non-conventional or non-traditional methods of non-invasive respiratory support in COVID-19. And with great pleasure I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Claudia Brusaska from Genoa, Liguria. Yes, Liguria? Liguria, Italy, who is, I think, a pioneer. And she published her data for the first time in COVID-19 about Venturi CPAP systems outside ICU. And she showed us very high rate of the efficacy of the system. Claudia, let's start from our interview. I think that our, our topic will be devoted not just to lecture and uh, I hope that you answer our um, sharp questions concerning, concerning uh, Venturi and CPAP systems outside ICU. And I would lo also like to introduce our highly qualified interpreters. This is Assistant Professor on Anesthesiology from Sechenov University, Irina Mandel, and uh, researcher from Pirogov University, Dr. Vasily Kananikhin. Claudia, thank you for your consent to participate as a speaker. Our Russian audience knew you well because we discussed your study outside ICU many times. So it's a great data to show during first wave uh, the very high efficacy of Venturi CPAP system outside ICU. So can you in brief tell us uh, some important information that you didn't reflect in your article? Your sensations concerning first wave, your sensations concerning Venturi systems, uh, what patients uh, will be uh, doing well on these systems, and so on? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, if we want to perform to a patient a continuous positive airway pressure, the only uh, system that we should use is a Venturi system, for sure. The, the main and a Venturi system with a high efficiency and high effectiveness. It means that it has to be a high flow Venturi system that generates very high flow. If uh, you have to use a Venturi system, you have to use the, the Venturi system that performs as higher airflow outputs uh, uh, as possible. This is a, a key message. And me. how, how can we set high flow? So we have uh, low flow oxygen, 15 liters. And do doctor can't imagine how can we set high flow from, from low flow system? No, uh, the Venturi does it. It depends on how the Venturi is uh, manufactured. So uh, who chooses uh, what device uh, to be uh, used in a hospital has to think about it. And unfortunately, often uh, who chooses uh, in the market is not who really uses it uh, after, or maybe in Italy is like that. So, um, because the Venturi is uh, uh, built, and as it is, it works. So the, the key message is that you have to have uh, uh, your Venturi, you have to know what your Venturi does exactly. So uh, with a certain amount of oxygen from the source, how much of airflow output it generates. How, how, how can we set the flow to patient? Uh, uh, we know the flow from the, from the wall, from the inlet. Yeah. And how can we calculate or think about figures of the flow in, in the mask? 
No, we uh, yes, we have to we have to know that uh, uh, patients, and this is uh, already demonstrated, uh, need at least sixty liter minute uh, of oxygen uh, oh, sorry of airflow output from the ventilator. How, how much? How much? Please repeat the, the, this figure. And least the minimum is a 60 liters 60 liters so we have 15 liters in the wall no, and no, 60 will be on winter from the wall you get uh, 10 liters uh, Claudia liters. discussing our venturi system uh, what, what is it is it Bosignac or something else more compli complicated what Sorry. is it Bosignac system or is, is it is it some uh, differences between Boussignac system or Venturi system? Okay, no, there is a big difference because uh, as I told you uh, the most important feature is uh, not the PEEP because pre positive end expiratory pressure because PEEP is always achievable uh, um, with the PEEP valve that is the high airflow output inside the interface. And uh, the Boussignac doesn't do any acceleration of uh, airflow. So if you, if you use a 30 liter from the wall, you give a 30 liter per minute rotation. So if I clearly understood, the difference is amplification of flow in Venturi system. Exactly. So CPAP is uh, equal, but here is flow equals to wall flow. Yeah, this is amplification of the floor, yeah? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So you, you, you didn't okay. use the Bosignac system, it was Venturi system. Absolutely yeah. not. The Bosniak system is, uh, can be comparable uh, to using a reservoir, um, a reservoir mask, okay, uh, with a little EPAP, a positive uh -huh. pressure at the mouth of the patient. But the patient breathing has to win always that positive pressure. So it's uh, it's very small, very small expiratory pressure will be. Very small, very small, and the, the patient is connected with the ambient air through the Lusignac valve. So it's not at all a continuous positive airway pressure. The, during the breathe, the patient goes always at zero, and so at the ambient air pressure. So it's uh, all the old technology, not very fitted for COVID patients, yeah? No. Well, uh, um, I I think uh, you could use if you have Lusignac and you have to use them. Uh, you could use a Lusignac much more similar uh, to a high flow nasal cannula. Maybe to conventional oxygen. But yes, but as a, as a way to administer oxygen therapy. But you have the, the you do not have the class of a humidified and uh, heated uh, oxygen flow as a high flow of nasal cannula. And also the comfort of the patient is, is much, much better with the high flow. So and what is the result in flow on your Venturi system? What? What is the result in flow? What is the flow on the mask in the patient? Uh, the, the two uh, Venturi that I use, one, the most uh, uh, used, goes up to 120. And so it, we're, talking, we're talking about low flow oxygen from 15 liters, yeah? From, from the source, it uses at least not more than 15 liters per minute. It was cylinder or something else? What? It was balloon, oxygen balloon, or it was from the wall? From the wall. From the wall. One, one point or two points? One inlet or two inlet? Two points if you need to add the CO2, to increase CO2. Otherwise, it works with one point. 
So one point can uh, give us uh, 100 liters flow, but but low FiO2, yeah? With with uh, 15 liter at the source. 120 at the mouth of the patient with 30 of CO2. 30 CO2. How can we increase FiO2? Using the second channel. The second. So if we took what, for example, this one, yeah? So this one is uh, first A. A, A is, is the flow. Is, is the flow, is the Venturi system. The Venturi system flow. So it's a yes. differ, difference. This is flow, the Venturi flow, and this is yes. the oxygen, white yes. one. Yes. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's different. We can switch it, yeah? No, because the, the B, the white one, doesn't work with the Venturi. So it white one doesn't work with Venturi. Yes. It's only FiO2. Then, yes. Only okay, okay. It's 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 very it's very important for us. The 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 mask. And uh, how what 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 uh, what flow will be sufficient for our patient with COVID nineteen? Uh, in my experience, COVID nineteen need a higher flow than sixty liters. Often uh, around eighty ninety. 80-90. Yes. And, and I have many COVID-19 patients that needed more than 120. And what about uh, tidal, resulting tidal volume? What about uh, psili, patient self-induced lung injury? What do you think about it? I think uh, uh, that psili is a problem, but it's uh, something that depends uh, uh, from patient to patient. You cannot uh, say that all patients are at psili risk and I think the risk of psili uh, is increased whenever the patient does a very high inspiratory effort. You can understand if with the CPAP well done, correctly applied, uh, you can stop reduce the inspiratory effort of the patient and so you are not going in, in, in the risk of psili and you are treating correctly the patient. If the... Uh, sorry, if sorry, I, I will uh, stop you, just uh, pause. Uh, how, what, what will be, what should I monitor in patient? You He's breathing spontaneously. I don't have volumeter. I don't have a flow meter. Uh, I don't have anything outside I see. What to do? You can use very, very easily the little manometer that is on your interface. Because uh, that... The, is, is, this one? It, yes. It was built just to understand which peep you were uh, applying but it moves with each uh, respiratory act of the patient. And if the patient uh, during inspiration uh, takes down... Uh, so swings of pressure. The swing of pressure that you have in the manometer is uh, the way to understand if the patient is working a lot with his diaphragm or not. So it will uh, reflect maybe transpulmonary pressure, yeah? Reflect uh, transformer pressure and work of the. Some assumptions, of course. Yes, obviously. You have to check the only thing before uh, that there is no leakages from the mask or the head. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the leakage can be the reason of the swing. So you have to make uh, sure that your interface is completely closed perfectly closed without leakages. Then if the swing is a lot, it means that the patient is doing a, a very high inspiratory flow, uh, effort and that you are not supporting it with the airflow output. You have to increase the airflow output as, as much as you can. Otherwise, it means that the, the patient needs uh, something else. I think intubation. 
what will be the markers or predictors of intubation in these patients? High swings of this pressure or something else, uh, accessory respiratory muscles, uh, deep I, breath and so on. Well, I think uh, that COVID-19, um, and it, it works only with COVID-19, yeah. apologies, um, that COVID-19 um, uh, Talked us to uh, not be so scared of a very, very uh, strong uh, hypoxia. Yeah. So uh, I think the, that in this uh, uh, patients, uh, the very big thing is the respiratory mechanics. So try to understand if you are supporting adequately. Um, the, the inspiratory heart and uh, uh, reduce the work of breathing. If you cannot do it, then it means that the patient will be uh, soon uh, too much tired and you will need uh, to intubate. Uh, do you think about intubation or maybe switching to non-invasive ventilation with pressure support? What do you think about pressure support in this patient? Uh, I am a little bit scared uh, on pressure support in non-invasive ventilation because uh, I think that because the problem is uh, the inspiratory effort, the, 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 the high tidal volumes of the patient, uh, because these patients are all hypocapnic because they, they breathe a lot, a lot. So I think that uh, um, uh, deep up or positive uh, or pressure support in non-invasive ventilation is uh, the most risky because uh, uh, we have the, the problem of the, uh, that we increase the tidal volume. We have the problem that uh, uh, there are the asynchronies. So you have to be very, very uh, good to apply this kind of uh, non-invasive ventilation and with the numbers that we have of COVID-19 patients to be treated uh, it's tricky because if the patient uh, becomes a lot of uh, asynchrony uh, a lot of asynchrony as with the, with the ventilator then uh, it will work much much work okay but it if we consider a specific uh, non-invasive ventilator with special system of triggering uh, without asynchrony and pressure support level which decreases the pressure swings, is it good? Yeah. Okay. So the second question, uh, uh, how to adjust PEEP in this system? So we told about FiO2, we told about flow, how to adjust PEEP? <coughs> Uh, it, the protocol that I wrote for my hospital was, uh, um, you have to think that we, we applied uh, often uh, 40 CPAP helmets continuously, 40 patients in wards that previously were internal medicine or infective disease wards, so not, absolutely not uh, uh, intensive care units and uh, not uh, um, places where there were uh, many nurses and so on. So um, the, I did a very easy, simple uh, protocol. So when the patient had to start the CPAP, they started all with 10 of P. This uh, was uh, um, this was decided on the experience of the first uh, peak pandemia in which we intubated many, many patients. And they had uh, at the open uh, lung test, at the peak test, uh, they, had, they were opening at low peaks. Okay, I, 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 I ask uh, not, not uh, what, what, what kind of pressure, but how technically you will set PEEP? Oh, okay, sorry. How to set um, six or four, eight or ten? Yeah, P, uh, the, using the PEEP valve, uh, mm -hmm. it around the time. Just this what one, yeah? Yeah, 
Yes, not more than 10. Uh, and then uh, monitoring, not more than 10, okay, I, I see. And the uh, uh, question concerning FIO2, uh, do you really measure it? Or you rely on uh, some tables, uh, calculations, so on? We use only the tables uh, from the manufacturer and uh, the tables I, I told my nurses that they have to look only at the uh, column of the table of the B channel. The A channel has to be adjusted to achieve the airflow output for supporting work of breathing of the patient. Not uh, to accept the table. The B column has to be used to achieve the CFQ that you want to get. To my mind, we, we, we can make the big uh, mistake uh, when we use calculation or tables up to two times in some uh, situations. Do you think that your FIU2 in your study was uh, real and PF ratio so, uh, w w was real and was not aggravated? Well, I think so because uh, uh, I think so because uh, I I I used uh, only 50 or 60 percent of your two uh, during CPAP because 60 was the maximum CO2 that I could have using the Venturi, not paying in less uh, uh, airflow output. And what what was the uh, oxygen saturation when you remove mask from the patient? They were going also very low. 70, 60, 40, what, what, what figure? Uh, well, uh, maybe uh, during the rest, I mean staying in the bed without yeah. moving, they were uh, going uh, from uh, maybe 92 during CPAP to 80, 80. But uh, if they were trying to go to the bathroom or eating or mm -hmm talking mm -hmm. are going very low and also becoming uh, immediately tachycardic. What, what, what figures? Very low, what figures? Oh, also 70, 60. 70. So, so 70 it's not very low. 70 it's about, f about 40 PAO2. Uh, mm, uh, in COVID-19 I didn't find this uh, strain correlation. Uh, right but when now, we talk about oxygen dissociation curve, yes. it will be just around it. Right now, I have uh, a patient that has uh, is going on CPAP helmet, and he has uh, PRO2 of 32 and the P uh, and the PCO2 of 32, so the same amount, and uh, he has a saturated. gas analysis tells us it's probably because uh, the, the amount of saturated oxygen is not so bad uh, watching that the API the happy hypoxia or mountain uh, hypoxia for, for, for me it's, for me it's a big discrepancy between uh, mortality in your patients and PF ratio which you showed us in your study PF ratio is incredible because uh, I, I often from the from the wards they call me because they increase the CO2 and the PF ratio goes down, but really down. So they call me because the PF ratio is 50. But actually, I I learn to look at PO2. 
and the saturated part of, the, of this oxygen. Because uh, uh, PF ratio, you can use PF ratio in this kind of patient only as a trend monitoring in the same patient. And also, if I have, uh, for example, 45, 40 of PiO2, but the patient has no signs of uh, uh, tissue suffering, of uh, um, organ perfusion suffering. Of course, but it's, it's normal physiology. It should be. We, we, we go into mountains, but don't have problems with perfusion. They do not have so much. They do not have so much. Yeah. Then, uh, um, my doc, my, 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 for example, infectious disease uh, physician, they see 42 and they add and they put a reservoir that is 90% 100 of CO2. And then they call me because from 42 it goes to 46. And this means that the PF is the half of before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, it's, it's normal from this kind of disease, unfortunately, that uh, these patients uh, do not uh, respond to a test of uh, resaturation from uh, increasing the PO2. So, so I, what I, kind of doctors work with your systems? Was it uh, surgeons, uh, gynecologists, uh, and so on? Not not intensivist. No, I was lucky. On the words, uh, on the I floors. I am a, I am an anesthesiologist and intensive care medicine. Yeah, doctor. yeah. Uh, but I did a PhD in uh, respiratory pathophysiology, and so for my hospital, I, I worked a lot of non on non invasive ventilation. So uh, what happened is that uh, during the pandemia, all my colleagues uh, went to work. Uh, in the ICU that became three times the one that we had and I was took uh, uh, and I had the, 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 the uh, my chief asked me to open 40 beds of non-invasive ventilation so I coordinated uh, the opening of these beds and I had uh, uh, infectious disease and internal medicine doctor. And so you were chief of internal medicine doctors? Yes, I, I was for that period um, the consultant that was uh, doing uh, uh, a huge work because uh, I was uh, 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 every day doing the round in six wards uh, of COVID-19 patients and uh, yeah. 40 beds, yeah? No, no, more, more. More. 180, 180 beds. 180 CPAP beds? No, 180 beds of COVID patients. Uh huh. And how much CPAP beds? Every day in each uh, ward to uh, see if somebody was getting worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was deciding uh, who was. Uh, the patient that was needing an invasive ventilation and moving the patient. We move, you, you move patients to ICU or it was outside the ICU? No, to the 40 beds of non invasive ventilation. So that was step step up word? Yes. Two words. Two words. How, how much beds? 40. 40 20. beds? 40 CPAP? Yes. So it was Venturi with mask or it was helmets or both? Yes, helmets and Venturi and uh, full face mask. Full face or, or nasal? No, full face. Full face. Uh, what, what do you think about interfaces? Is it uh, some, some difference or much differences uh, concerning uh, prognosis of the patient or um, comfort? I think the, the I think the best comfort is the helmet. The maximum harm, comfort will be helmet. Yes. Why? But uh, well, in this experience tells us because uh, 
Before, I had a very big problem to use helmets in my hospital out from the ICU. Very big problem. Because uh, nurses were scared, uh, internal medicine doctors were, were scared. Scared of, scared of masks or of, of helmets? helmets? Of helmets. We, we, we see the, the same picture in Russia. Our doctors scared of helmets. Why? Yeah. Please sh tell us why. It seems something... Uh, Huge. That, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the patient could not breathe inside. It seems something like that. But then, when we had the pandemia, and uh, I wanted for this COVID bag, uh, patients who have uh, three meals per day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Mm -hmm. But it had to be very quick because they were desaturated. And uh, they were too many patients. Immediately they started using helmets and now, now nurses want only helmets. Because are really easier, are really uh, much more comfortable to, for the patient. So the patient uh, get less delirium or agitation or and uh, so now I'm in the opposite situation in which sometimes I think it's better a mask just because it's a short treatment or something like that and they do not want to use uh, it's interesting uh, please tell us uh, your it's advice it's how fine. to uh, switch our doctors and nurses to helmets yeah. in their minds. <laughs> so the, you, you also leave the helmet on the patient always. You put the helmet once and the helmet stays there for 15 days, for 15 days. You open the zip, take mm -hmm. off as a cap, the patient eats and then close. And it's uh, very easy and it's much more rare that you have uh, uh, leakages or problems in fitting the, the mask, the, the helmet instead of the mask. So it becomes, I have patients with COVID in, inside the helmet reading. Uh, did you compare hel helmets and masks in the study? Concerning uh, outcomes or uh, comfort? No. No, because uh, it was uh, the study was really done in the first uh, six months of pandemia. I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Horrible, and uh, I can tell you that the number is more helmets than masks. Uh, but I often it happened that we were starting with the mask, changing with the helmet in second day, so there were many movements <laughs> in the faces. Now it's everything is much more uh, um, done, uh, thinking about and choosing. Uh, it's a little bit more. Uh, so what, what uh, fire tool you usually use used in your study? Fifty to sixty fire tool. Started always with fifty. Mm -hmm. and the increasing to 60 only if the patient was under 45 of the altitude. Mm -hmm. So, to and my it mind, it, it was the patient with moderate uh, RDS, not, not severe. What? It was moderate hypoxemia, not, not severe. PF ratio 200 to 100, not less than 100. Uh, Am I right? I had also less. I had also less because uh, I treated uh, some patients with 50-60 uh, of pH pressure. Uh, I think the last one was, was 53. Of sure, of, of sure, I can tell you that these patients, now we are treating these patients because we want to treat them in this way. In that moment, we were treating these patients because we didn't have beds, ICU beds, mm -hmm. or because they were do, uh, not uh, intubate patients. But many of them went well. Please, could you repeat your success rate uh, for your patients on the first wave uh, outside ICU? 
for the audience? Um, outside the ICU, we had uh, uh, sorry, uh, 80, 83. Yeah, 80, uh, no, it was the 13% of patients. Were, sorry, I, I have to check, I do not remember. <clears throat> For the 13% of patients that went intubated, sorry, 14% uh, of patients went intubated. So, so and what what was the outcome of these patients who were intubated? The intubated one was worse. Uh, I think uh, uh, the intubated one was worse. I think of these 13 patients, because we are talking about 13 patients, uh, I think uh, 10 deaths and 3 alive. So it's a very, very bad outcome for these patients who are non-responder to CPAP. Yes. We have, we have uh, also the same picture in Russia. So we use predominantly non-invasive ventilation, uh, as, as, as you showed us. And we use it uh, in our ICU or outside ICU. But we have the same picture. Patients who intubated had a very bad outcome. And, and, and I, I, I'm, very, I'm very interested in the published data when uh, somebody showed me um, outcomes uh, with a survival rate about 60% on uh, invasive ventilation. I think uh, I, um, we had uh, not bad uh, uh, outcome of the first pandemic peak from uh, uh, ICU because we had 57% of good outcome from the ICU but uh, I can tell you for sure um, that uh, those 37 patients uh, that we intubated at the beginning uh, um, most of all uh, right now uh, could go very well only with non-invasive ventilation because at the beginning the first uh, weeks people arriving with the such uh, low PF ratio we were intubating them immediately but so at now uh, they had the less uh, CT scan um, uh, uh, gravity of uh, the pneumonia and uh, for both PF ratio now we do not intubate anymore any pneumonia and these patients that went well from the ICU but they had a very very tough way to get up of ratio so, so 60 days of ICU and so on. So, so to make a uh, little conclusion about this uh, small topic. So during this pandemic, pandemia, you decrease intubation rate. Yes, absolutely. In the second, uh, I can tell you that in the, I will publish this data, but in the second peak, uh, we talk about November 2020, May 2021, so many months more, I treated the 450 CPAP patients and, uh, I, and in ICU, in my hospital, we had 23 patients of the five of 450 patients treated with non-invasive ventilation. From these 23 patients, obviously, I have a 76% of mortality. 76. Yes. Nobody published this data. We, we tried to publish data from the first wave uh, uh, in pa patients with uh, non-invasive ventilation failure. Our mortality was about uh, uh, 80%. And uh, nobody believe us from the journal. We have uh, uh, actually from the second peak pandemia, I have a mortality in CPAP of 12 percent, and the mortality in ICU of the few, very few patients that went in ICU of 76. But the reason is that we we intubate only desperate cases. Uh, we, we know, you know, in, in Russia we have uh, some wrong beliefs 
in our doctors, I think. First of all, that uh, non-invasive ventilation outside ICU is uh, g goes to bad, pr bad outcome. Or maybe it's uh, out of the law. What do you think? No, out of the law, absolutely not. Uh, especially with uh, these Venturi, because uh, they are really easy to be used. There are three, three things that your nurses and your physician has to know, and three things that they know that if they happen, they have to call us. So it's not much different from uh, standard oxygen therapy? Absolutely. From yes. technical uh, point of view? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, there is a huge work at the beginning of uh, uh, training. I did a huge work of training. And I tell you that the thir in the first peak pandemic, I was doing the three rounds per day to check only keep. Uh, air flow out is very, very uh, basic things. But now, from the second peak pandemia, they rarely call us. They call us because, the, the, for sure, the, um, the skills that we have in just uh, to do something different from normal is ours and cannot be done from other physicians. But if you give them a, a flow chart and they have to follow that and with simple rules, they start like that. And if they have problems or not, they call us. It works very well. Very good. And we have uh, another wrong belief. Early intubation saves lives. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Well, uh, during the first peak pandemia, uh, during the first two weeks, I, I was thinking too, too because uh, with uh, looking at certain hemogas analysis, we want to, to get a tube location. And then I was uh, surprised that it was going differently. I have a, a funny story um, in the third, I think it was the fifth day. In five days from the start in my city, we had the, the ICU full. And it arrived with the wife of the, of the guy that was intubated. So the husband was intubated and the wife was, was even worse, but we didn't have any more beds. And she was also a doctor. And I, I put her uh, in the evening uh, a helmet, thinking, really thinking that it was not the best choice for her, but the only one I had. And this lady went very well in uh, about 12 or 13 days and was out from the hospital in 25 days. And the husband had a, a went well also him fortunately but he was less ill than her uh, but with a very long uh, problems also uh, very astenic and uh, tracheostomia and a, a very long also he had the sepsis later and he stayed 60 days in icu Th those are patients that now we do not intubate at all uh, what monitoring do you use in these patients? Tidal volume, on exhale tidal volume, uh, diaphragm, uh, ultrasound, accessory respiratory muscles, uh, work and so on? Well, uh, in the non-invasive patients, not, we do not perform non-invasive ventilation in ICU. We have two less beds to do that. So, um, all beds even if are normal uh, words, not the uh, not the uh, subintensive words, all beds have uh, a multi-parameter monitor, and in which I have the respiratory frequency. That is something that usually nurses do not uh, uh, get. 
and it's uh, really important. And then uh, in, we use uh, the manometer, and in the cases uh, more uh, difficult, we use a Venturi system that has, <coughs> I have only four of these, that have a multi-parametric monitor in, inside, in, in, together with, and uh, it, it does a study of the delta P inside the interface that gives me the idea of uh, uh, the work of me. More so the delta pressure in, in, inside the circuit of Venturi system, yeah? Yeah, no, inside the interface, inside the helmet. Inside the helmet. And uh, it, it's uh, something much, much more precise than uh, the use of the manometer, the column of the manometer, as I told you before. So you use special device to monitor uh, pressure, delta pressure inside the helmet? Yes. yes. And, and what, 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 what uh, delta pressure drives you to intubate patient? Well, this monitor is, uh, is a manufacturer by who did also the Venturi, so actually uh, it's very easy because it gives you green if you are in a good swing. Mm -hmm. and and if you are in a, a bad swing and uh, the patient is working a lot. So in these cases, nurses know that they have to increase their flow output as much as possible. Increase what, sorry? Nurses know that if the, if the, the monitor goes in red, uh -huh. part, then they have to increase the uh, the airflow out. A, a flow, yeah? yeah. So increase this A flow. Yeah, but it's another venturi. It's more more performing venturi. Mm -hmm. It's another one, but it's similar. They have to increase the airflow output. Then, if the increase is the maximum the performance, increase, then they have to call us. So if uh, red zone uh, persists, they call call you and you transfer to ICU and then intubate. Yes. And what about uh, working of uh, accessory respiratory muscles, uh, diaphragmatic amplitude I, I and suffix infraction? Well, I use a lot of uh, lung ultrasound and diaphragm ultrasound, uh, but I have to be honest uh, with the numbers of the COVID-19 patients, uh, we could do it uh, in a selected number of patients. So when there was a problem, when I was really didn't want to intubate a patient, but I couldn't understand what was happening, then I was performing but, but Otherwise, it was impossible. But did you measure the uh, scale tidal volume in selected patients? What it would be? With CPAP, I, I never measured the tidal volume. What do you think? Is it, is it high tidal volume or we are in uh, protective ventilation ranges or not? Uh, well, with CPAP, there are studies that already, physiological studies on non invasive ventilation that already tell us that with CPAP, the, the tidal volume is less than in uh, uh, spontaneous breathing and in uh, BPAP. So, um, I think you can understand if it's less just looking at the, at the small swing of the manometer or looking at a diaphragm that stays very low and doesn't do too much Contraction. So, for example, you see the patient <gasps> with the what? 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 What uh, would you do? Oh, that, that patient has to be stopped <laughs> with uh, a positive pressure and an airflow that goes inside his mouth. So you increase airflow. The A. Or you increase uh, CPAP. No, no, no! Absolutely not. I do not move the, the PEEP, the PEEP stays at 10. And PEEP I, 10 in all patients? 
the in the COPD patient five, not ten. Too much. In a busy patient with obesity. And uh, sometimes I try to go to 12, just to balance uh, the, the, um, the, the, press, the abdominal pressure. And then uh, I increase, the first thing, I increase oxygen from the skin. To be sure to give the maximum airflow output as possible. Then the second step for me is uh, move the patient to the uh, venturi system that works ma more so the meaning is use the airflow output higher around it arrives at 140 it also fits you depends on the field too that you want then the third step for me is to use the balloon the balloon is uh, something uh, that increases pressurization of the system. How, how you in, uh, insert balloon in your system? The balloon is uh, uh, something that goes between the venturi and the... It's, it's a reservoir back. Yes, yeah? the reservoir back. This uh, increases the pressurization of the system and makes the patient not should make the patient not to be able to do the inspiratory effort. Uh, it, it, it should be uh, maybe drawn on uh, I think that our, our, our audience doesn't understand w w about what you're talking about. If you want I can show you a picture. Yeah can you show us a picture now because uh-huh uh-huh okay thank you. Okay. So this is the balloon full screen yeah it's full this screen yeah system. this is the venturi system with the this is the flow generator yeah what it's a venturi generator mm -hmm. with the monitor that gives me an idea of the work of breathing and this is the balloon so you use conventional b uh, tube circuit yes this and is divided by, by two this is the third step, the last step before intubating the patient. So this is the last step before intubation? Yes. This step can, can, can last very less time. I mean, this uh, patient, I think, used the balloon two hours and then got intubated. And what is the efficacy in this category of patients? No, not many. I think I used the uh, seven, eight balloons from, uh, from from March 2020 to now. Not many. Not many. Okay. Seven, eight patients. Uh, what, 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 what is the monitoring of this system? Can you show us? Uh, can yeah. you zoom uh, zoom in this? I show you this. Uh, this monitor gives me the saturation, the uh, cardiac frequency, the PEEP that is much more obviously precise than the column, the PO2 that is adjustable just moving this. The so it it's, it's, uh, will be a good accuracy of the PHI2, yeah? Yes, yes, perf perf it's really perfect. <laughs> this accuracy, mm -hmm. then you can monitor the temperature inside the helmet, it works only with helmet, the airflow output, so you can see 140, 120, 100, and so on, and the respiratory frequency. Then there is this line with the cursor here that moves every respiratory act of the patient. So and it's delta when, pressure? Yes, and when it goes here in the red, you have to move this and increase the air the, the flow. Yes. And where, where, where is the probe? Where is it located? What? Where is the tip of the probe, of the pressure probe? Can you show us the tip of the probe? Inside the helmet, I think. Uh, 
you have the the the, the this is the line here and goes inside here nearby you have the, mm, the connector with the temperature and this is for the pressure inside the pressure transducer okay then on the other side you have the filter and the peak valve mm -hmm. okay it's very interesting you can use this also with the mask why you use total face mask but not or nasal? They have the much more uh, dead space. Yes, but or nasal it's impossible to keep a, a or nasal uh, mask on on a patient for uh, more than eight, eight hours and not have the skin laser. We are talking about 15 days of treatment. It's impossible for the patient. It's too much. Mm, the oral nozzle uh, can can be used for the COPD patients, hypercapnic patients, but with the B ladder. But these are different patients. Uh, I, I really think it doesn't make sense. Moreover, this mask in particular has uh, two holes, as you see. It's the only one I think mm -hmm. in the market right now, and these two holes makes also, if we are doing a CPAP, a simple CPAP, to have a, a way that is the inlet and a way that is the outlet, okay? This makes not rebriefing of CO2. So, uh, this is called the uh, zero rebriefing, and actually we have a, a, a less of 30% of rebriefing of CO2. You really can use these masks also in CPAP modality, also in intercapnic patient. In but it's not vented mask. What? It's not vented mask. No, yes. I, I, I can see the... Um, this is closed. The holes. No holes. Absolutely no. The airflow output comes out only from here. Mm -hmm. From the pit valve. But you have, you have white piece here there. Yeah? Why peace? Uh, no. This is closed. When you buy this, you have also a connector with the with the, the valve here that it uh, has to be used with the ventilator that needs the valve here that are the deep up ventilator. But, but can we use non uh, non vented mask like this? I do not see you. Wait. Uh, this is non vented mask. This is Venturi system. It's Venturi system uh, with low, low flow oxygen. Uh, no, I am in trouble because uh, I have to interrupt. Uh, wait. I interrupt you. Okay, I see you again. Can you, see, can you see our non-vented mask? It's a Venturi yes. mask, one yes. point of oxygen, yes. low flow, yes. and vented mask. Yes. So, uh, do you think that the efficacy of this mask will be uh, comparable or less or not? When we use one, one uh, inlet of oxygen. But uh, it depends. It has a venturi. No. Where is the venturi? Here is it. You have to. You have to understand that venturi, how it works. Looking, looking, just looking at that venturi, it cannot do a very high airflow output. I tell you why. The oxygen arrives perpendicular to where he has to um, suck uh, ambient air. Just this is a problem. So this will be uh, low FiO2, yeah? I think so, but... Because I, it sucks ambient air. Yes, yes. So this is for not, not, not very bad patients. It sucks. So it's not for very bad patients. No. It's a patient with, with the more mild uh, hypoxemia, I think. Yeah, I think so. Okay. 
But when we're talking about two points, we can uh, adjust it for patient with moderate and severe hypoxemia, yeah? Yeah. Because th this is uh, with sucks uh, inventory system the oxygen, but not uh, ambient air. The ambient air. Uh, sorry, I show you to, to to things about this because it's okay. This is yeah. the inventory system we are looking at. The inventory is this black blue part. The oxygen arrives from the blue channel and get these narrows from here he sucks ambient air okay from here he gets ambient air you see they are parallel or in the same way they, they work and this makes a very good acceleration of the oxygen flow so i put 15 liters from here and I get 120 here and I can show you, wait Can you show, okay. show us the table, the table of uh, the flows, resulting flows and the FIO2 and CPAP? Yes, the, the, yes, this is uh, the study that I did to understand the minimum air flow output needed that is 60. You see that Above 60, you have a decrease of the delta P, so the work of breathing. And if you give the patient less air to output, as less as you give, it increases a lot the delta P. Okay? Then uh, these are the two venturi systems that I use. And uh, this is what this venturi system does. So. You see, with 5 of P, 15 liter here, I get 120 of, ox of air flow output with 31 of CO2. And to only, only, only use only one, one inlet? A. Yes, this is the Venturi system performance, and you have to test it using the inlet that does the Venturi, that is the A one, the blue one for us. Then, if you increase speed, you have a decrease, obviously, of the airflow output, but the worst one is still 90, okay? 90, 90, 90 is perfect. Yes, and because of this high airflow, the PO2 remains stable between 30 and 35. And, and we continue to discuss flows and the table uh... yes yes i was uh, telling you that uh, this is an example of how you have to know your venturi system sorry because you have to know exactly what it does uh, I, I, I want i want you to tell us two yeah, great things one Concerning this table of flows and pressures and FIO2. As I told you, you should always know what your Venturi does. For example, we know that with 5 of people and the FIO2 is a patient with hypoxia. We do this. И сколько у нас поток, сколько нужно минут, какой у нас входной поток кислорода и выходной поток. И какая у нас фракция кислорода. Поскольку вы знаете, какое мы даем давление и поток, так кислород у нас не будет меньше 60. Потом вы можете использовать вторую таблицу. Вот это. Вы должны ее использовать, чтобы смотреть, какой поток сделать, какой процент вы получите. Чтобы получить определенный процент кислорода. Вы должны выставить определенный поток воздуха на одном ракометре. 
we will look at the table and put 16 in the B line. You should not put 8 in the A line. Why? A is the oxygen source to get 60 liters per minute. The table obviously has to give you the amount of oxygen from the source in the A channel to achieve 60, that's the minimum. But it might be not enough for your patient. So my suggestion is not to set up the A channel with this table, but to use the manometer column. Put the interface in a way that you are sure you do not have leakages, then set up the PEEP using the PEEP valve, and at this point you look at your column. You, it, you need at least the three respiratory acts of the patient, not too much, 30 seconds. If the, <clears throat> this cursor is a stable around the value of the PEEP that you want, it's okay. If during inspiration this goes down, then it's not okay, it's not enough for the amount of airflow output inside the, uh, the, the interface. So you just have to, sorry, <coughs> increase the amount of oxygen from the source. Okay? From the A source, A source, flow from the A source. Source, okay, sure. Maintaining the B as your table tells us to get the CO2 that you want. Is it clear? Okay, okay. It's clear, thank you. Cloud yeah, thank you. So when you, when you replied to my invitation, you mentioned your new study. Mentioned your new study. And would you yes. please tell us in short what you have done and what you had found? Yes, the, um, what I found is that, uh, well, I, I just uh, the, want to describe uh, the new population. What I found is uh, that uh, we use the CPAP in 450 patients. That's a huge number uh, watching at the other uh, population of the other studies right now uh, coming out. And uh, we had, uh, as I told you, uh, wait, I do not remember, without, and uh, we had uh, a very low uh, mortality and a very low number of patients that went to uh, intubation and ICU. This is the, the, the huge um, result. And the determinants mm, of the worst, uh, uh, so we had a mortality in the CPAP group of 12%. And, and what interface uh, did you use? What? What interface did you use in this study? Mixed. Completely mixed because as, as I told you, the second peak pandemia was uh, um, <laughs> was uh, of these patients was uh, completely uh, done by uh, the in, in infectious disease uh, physicians following my flow chart. And they were calling uh, me or some my colleagues uh, only if they had the problems. So the most patients were done by them and depending on age, depending on, on setting, I mean, uh, depending on nurses and so on, the, the, choose, the choice of the helmet or the face mask was completely uh, demanded to them. It's an observational study, retrospective, and what I can tell you is the only determinant um, for worsening of the and, and failure of neonimbus ventilation was uh, the PF ratio underneath 70. 
70? Yes. Okay. Uh, we did the. Um, uh, we are still uh, doing some uh, statistical analysis, but we did uh, uh, multivariate analysis and we analyzed all uh, CP with the TSS score, and there is no determinant on age, on uh, uh, illness uh, or of the patient, uh, on. Uh, uh, the gravity of the CT scans. Uh, the only determinant is the field. Okay, thank you, Claudia. We are so sorry, we are less of time. And uh, thank you for your great discussion, for your consent to participate. Uh, it was great time for me and for our audience. Also for me, thank you very much. I, 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 I see that you're very tired and this is a Friday evening <laughs> it's not the time to to make some webinar I think but sorry no 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 don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I, I, I want to hear Giuseppe now yeah 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 okay so I think that we can uh, start our discussion with Professor Giuseppe Forti Giuseppe can you hear us? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, Giuseppe, thank you for your consent to participate in our respiratory discussion. And I hope that you remember our last meeting in Moscow in December uh, 15. The one respiratory school in uh, Moscow city. So, uh, I, I think that you uh, were, were you, you was with us uh, during this discussion with Claudia, See, and uh, yes, yeah, I think that you have uh, something to add. Uh, it it was uh, first of all concerning helmets, because we talked predominantly on uh, Venturi systems and and the masks and the mixed uh, mixed and helmets. And we've read with great interest your recent review in critical care concerning technical aspects of helmet zip up and Neve. And uh, would you please, first of all, do you think that uh, some difference exists between helmet and uh, mask concerning patient outcomes, first of all? Well, I think so, and there is a, as I remember, there, there is an old Italian study uh, done on hematological patient uh, by the group of Tiziana Principi, in which they demonstrated that using CPAP, helmet, or mask, they had a better outcome using the helmet, just because helmet can be tolerated for longer period of time. So ideally, we would like to keep the patient 24 hours a day for many days inside the helmet. This, it, it is, this is very difficult to obtain. But it's much easier with the helmet than with a face mask. Is, is it the only explanation? Because in Russia we use masks 24 hours a day, not problem. 10 days and so on. Do you think also that you only tolerance the problem or maybe something else? Well, the Russian might be different from the Italians. <laughs> uh, you, you <laughs> more, more patient maybe. Well, uh, I... Mask, they have improved a lot. Full face masks are more tolerated than oral facial mask. But usually, not only me, but in the literature, they say that it cannot be tolerated for so long period of time. Anyway, I think that if you are able to make a patient stay on a mask, SIPA, for a long period of time, the advantages of the helmet decreases. 
So in, in your in your paper, you mentioned that uh, pressure swings when patient has high drive is much more on the mask than on helmet. Do you think that it's really so? Certainly, because uh, uh, the mask system is a rigid system. So even if you provide a very high flow, uh, when the patient inspires at the peak inspiratory flow, that can be 90, 120 liter per minute, even more. In such a circumstances, you have the pressure going down in the circuit because what the patient is asking is less than what is more than what the circuit is giving to the patient. But when so we use this, for uh... this reason, you have oscillation in the circuit. So you have to use a balloon reservoir to minimize this system. And this when problem. we use a conventional ventilator, ICU ventilator, do you see this pressure drop or not? No. During mask. But it depends which which system you are using, in which modality. CPAP? Uh, or first of all, CPAP. CPAP. Peak inspiratory flow of the respirator can be as high as high 180 liter per minute. 180. So they are very, very fast. Huh? But unfortunately, with a ventilator, you have always a trigger system. So I don't think you get a bigger advantage using a ventilator compared to the high flow Venturi mask. Uh, do, do, we, do we have some differences between a turbine based ventilator or gas compression ventilation? ventilator? To, to, in the past, yes. Now, to bind ventilator, high level to bind ventilator, no, 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 not ventilator for uh, home ventilation, but standard to bind ventilator are providing very good flow, very good flow. So it can be comparable with Venturi system, yeah? Yes, it, it can be comparable. They are also stable. You have that just to check the pressure inside the circuit. If you connect it to a ventilator, uh, you can uh, watch the pressure, pressure swing. profile, pressure swing, and then you can judge in this way how, how accurate it is. So if I clearly understood, uh, when we compare uh, quality of flow from Venturi system outside ICU, uh, ICU ventilator, with the um, um, turbine, it can be comparable. It can be equal. Yeah. Concerning CPAP, so we yeah. can we can uh, exclude ICU ventilator and switch patient to Venturi system and outside ICU. Yes. Yes. There is also an advantage if you use. Uh, the uh, face mask that Claudia showed you, that was talking about, the one with the two holes. Mm -hmm. You can provide in this way washing of the mask that, that, space. Space, uh, that occurs during expiration because you have a continuous flow inside the mask that wash out the CO2. So the rebreathing of CO2 is less compared to what happens if you provide CPAP with a ventilator. You understand the point? If you use the two holes mask, if you use a continuous Can you show us a picture? Can you show us a picture on slide just to demonstrate? Yeah. This is a standard mask with mm -hmm. only one hole and the white mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. The blue is the CO2. Mm -hmm. 
This is the mask with the two holes. Inlet here, outlet here. So it's a special mask? It's a special mask. It's a special one. That is called D-Max Zero. Mm -hmm. the, the principle is very simple. Instead mm -hmm. of having only one hole, in which you have inspiration, then expiration, yeah. you have inspiration from this side and expiration from this side. Let me move this one. Look at what happened. The blue is the CO2. Mm -hmm. This is inspiration. Now both the patient expire. In one case, CO2 accumulates inside. In this case, because there is a continuous fresh flow of gases, the mask is the CO2 inside the mask is washed out. Did you did you did you see the, the, the point? Yes, perfect. Here the, the flow is the same. It is a flow, if I remember well, around 90 liters per minute. But during uh, with this system during expiration the flow goes from year to year. See? Hop, 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 hop. So Instead here, during expiration, the flow goes inside the mask and then comes out from the other side. So the CO2 that the patient is expiring is washed out from the mask. And so it decreases the dead space of the mask. So it's, it's very important point concerning one technology but the different uh, tips of this technology yeah it's just so, that you have exactly is a technological improvement done with a very simple idea to separate and, 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 and we have some problem with, with helmet maybe you can show us in this helmet how to do this uh, phenomenon mm -hmm. on helmet so wait we have second. helmet wait a second do you have a picture with helmet? I don't see you very well. I should have I should conclude the sharing and now I see you. The mm -hmm. helmet is different. Anyway, show me, yeah. Here is the helmet. Yeah. We can we can uh, connect this to ventilator like this one or like uh, this one. Alright. What is the the best one? Okay. May I show you some pictures? Yeah, of course, Otherwise of course. Otherwise, we make confusion. Yeah. I'll try here. <laughs> yeah. So, theoretically, theoretically, you could connect your helmet. We are talking about CPAP here. So, With A is the Venturi, simple Venturi system, yeah? Okay, this is the Venturi system that you discussed with Claudia. Outside now. I see you, outside I see you. Outside I see you. You could eventually connect the system also to a hair and oxygen blender, all right, but it's the same concept. There are differences that maybe we can discuss later on using this one. This system is more uh, present maybe in ICU. Anyway, this is not the point. The point is this one. You can connect the helmet CPAP to a ventilator through a Y piece or through a true two line inspiration and expiration. Okay? In the ventilator is written CPAP, 8 of PIP, FIO2 50%. Do those two systems are wrong. You must not do it. You must not do it. Why it is wrong? It is wrong because inside the helmet there is not enough flow to wash out the CO2. What to do? You have to connect the helmet for CPAP to a free flow system as the one that Claudia discussed till now. Otherwise, and I should show you something. <clears throat> Look here what happened. Okay. This is a second. So this we should switch from ventilator to just Venturi system from the from the wall? Yes. Even if you use it on the general ward, in emergency department, in ICU, 
at home, whatever you use the helmet in CPAP, you must provide a flow, enough flow, let's say minimum 60 liters per minute, to wash out the CO2 that the patient is expiring. Look here what happened. This is an helmet with a flow inside of 90 liters, independently from the PIP and the FIO2. Forget about that. The patient is expiring now. Wait a second, she's gonna do it here. And you see, during exhalation, is a, the high flow provides the clearance of the CO2, 90 liters per minute. Now let's move to the, if we put in the helmet a flow of 20 liter per minute, this is what happened. Patient is expiring now, and the CO2 stay inside the helmet. And at the next inspiration, the patient is inhaling the CO2, providing rebreathing of CO2 that is dangerous. If you connect the helmet to a ventilator in CPAP modality, you have certainly always, no matter what, re a huge rebreathing of CO2 because the ventilator does not provide more than 20 liters. If you have a patient on CPAP, the ventilator will provide the flow enough to maintain the CPAP. That is the minute volume of the patient. Did you get Maybe the point? Maybe we should it's switch crucial. to press support or not? In this uh, situation? Pressure support. Well, I'll give you a straightforward answer. The amount of rebreathing of CO2 that you have inside the, the helmet depends on the flow that you put inside the helmet. So if it's in CPAP, in pressure support, in B level, whatever you want, if you're a ventilator, if your ventilator reads on the display 18 liters per minute, 20 liters per minute of respiratory tidal volume, you have a huge rebreathing of CO2. It is very, very simple. The amount of CO2 inside the helmet is the amount of CO2, CO2 produced by the patient divided the flow inside the helmet. But when I, when I, when, when I, when I see on the ventilator flow, simple. 100. 100 liter of flow. Yeah. The, the ventilator Peak flow, 100 on the ventilator. It does not depend on the peak flow on the ventilator. It depends on the minute ventilation that the ventilator provides inside the helmet. Let's see if we are lucky a second. Wait a second. I'm not, I'm not sure if we are lucky or not. <coughs> it depends. I have to check something. So it's not peak flow, it's uh, no, minute it, ventilation, yeah? Yeah, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> yes. It's a, I understand that doctors do not like mathematics. I do <laughs> yes. understand. I am a doctor and I do not like mathematics. <laughs> yes. But it is very simple. You, uh, you, let's assume you produce 300 ml of CO2. If you expire those 300 ml inside the the helmet, if the flow is 30 liter per minute, you divide 300 ml divided 30,000 ml, that is 30 liter, and you get 1%. This is the concentration of CO2 that you have inside the helmet. 1% means mm -hmm. 7 millimeter of mercury. If 7 the flow is half, if you use the pressure support, it's exactly the same. It has been demonstrated clearly. This is something that is not in discussion. It's, it's a very clear cut point. So but, but, do, not you, do not use CPAP mode so and connect it to the ventilator. Don't do it. We have read recently the paper in JAMA uh, by Domenica Luca Greca, you know, si. uh, si. which compare in helmet. Si. See. With high flow and helmet was connected to ICU ventilator. What can you, what commentary do you, can you make? 
the patient were rebreathing CO2. And uh, they showed us very high efficacy. You know, uh, uh, beside it is not very true because uh, if you look carefully, the outcome is not very different. And they were less intubated, but the guy that were intubated die more. So, but the point, uh, when we discuss about mortality, there are so many variables. But when we discuss of technicality, technicality are there. And, the, and there is no question that the day, if you use partial support, you increase the ventilation of the helmet. So maybe you see 20 liter, 25, because you apply pressure and pressure expand the helmet. But you have certainly CO2 rebreathing. Maybe this CO2 rebreathing is not so bad, can be tolerated by the patient, but it's something that I, I, I do not want uh, to deal with. I do not want to have patients rebreathing CO2. They are already on distress, respiratory distress. I do not want to add another distress. Do you understand my reason? Yes, yes. Giuseppe, certainly, please, please. Certainly, if you compare high flow nasal cannula to helmet, you get certainly higher PEEP level, a higher lung recruitment. No question about it. So there are the advantages of the more lung recruitment versus the rebreathing. But my solution is I don't want to use the pressure support on such patient. I don't want to use it even on, on, on the helmet because it's, in my opinion, is complicated. And I do not like to push air on those lung. So why not to use the CPAP? simple and safer because it does not push air into the lung that is not a good idea so uh, to conclude this brief uh, topic so you only recommend use uh, venturi system without ventilator yes yes okay Thank you. Unless if, if I if I if I can, I I hope I do not confuse your ideas. But there are ventilators, turbine or compressed gas ventilator that provide the menu oxygen O2 therapy. It means the ventilator push air outside the inspiratory line do you understand so you put the, you use the ventilator in, instead of the venturi system instead. so it's, it's, it's ventilator then you apply the peep valve so it's ventilator will be in the in high flow oxygen mode yeah or not yes yes so we we should use helmets with ventilator switching it to high flow oxygen mode yeah yes it depends the amount of flow that the ventilator do provide. As I recall, for example, the Dreger ventilator provide maximum 50 liters per minute. That is a bit marginal. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it's, it's turbine-based ventilator. No, Dreger is not turbine-based ventilator. But Savina is turbine-based. Eh? Savina is turbine-based. Yeah, but the, the, I, I don't know anything about Savina. I know that the Dreger Evita 4 and no, the, the last one, uh, 500, whatever, uh, Infinity, I don't remember the name, sorry. But, but, but I uh, think that Savina provides us 200 liters per minute. You sure? Mm, not sure, but uh, they told me about this figure. The, the, the important point, the important point, you have to have continuous flow provided or by the Venturi or by the mixer of the ICU or by the ventilator going inside the helmet and then out it goes to a PIP valve, external PIP valve finish. Do not put the expiratory limb inside the ventilator. Do not use CPAP modality, otherwise the ventilator start to think 
that he has to provide a, mod a ventilatory modality, a CPAP, and so the logic of the ventilator is not to provide 60, 70, 80, 90 liters per minute, but just the flow needed to maintain a good CPAP. I have, I'm afraid I confuse your ideas. No, 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 no. Ah, okay. No, no, no. I'm so uh, uh, another question: When you, when we uh, use not ICU ventilator, but special non-invasive ventilator, which of ventilator high sorry, quality? Could you repeat? Sorry. Could you repeat the, the type of ventilator? Uh, Respironics. Okay. For example, uh, it's special non-invasive ventilator which uh, could provides high flow, I think. Can we use helmets in this situation? Back to this picture here. This modality with the white piece here is bad because CO2 accumulate inside here. Do you use the respironics in this way? No, yes. no. They one, one, yeah, one, one, one so, line. Because, Only one line. Yeah, it's bad anyway because you have the uh, whisper flow, right? Yeah. Okay. They have it here, right? Here at this point. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So during expiration flow goes through this limb here or through the whisper flow and CO2 accumulate inside the helmet. CO2 accumulate inside the helmet. The only way to avoid accumulation of CO2 inside the helmet is pushing air inside the helmet through a pit valve. Finish. If you put the expiratory limb going inside the helmet, it can be dangerous. Maybe we can uh, make some uh, uh, interesting uh, things like uh, open uh, helmet uh, and uh, periodically and then close it again. No, don't do it. No, no, no. No, I, I, do, I, I do not recommend. Why? If you want to use the ventilator, a turbine ventilator, sorry that I don't have a picture. You, you have your turbine ventilator here. Let me take mm -hmm. out the, this way. Let's, let's do this way. Let's assume yeah. this is our ventilator. Yeah. Inspiratory limb yeah. goes inside here. And the, here you must have the PIP valve. Only yeah. the PIP valve. Let me see if I can do something. Fermi tutti. Penna, puntatore laser. No. No. Non deve... Uh, flow must not go back, back on the ventilator. The ventilator should only provide flow in this one direction. Limb, one limb. One limb. And the modality should be... Oh. Hey, ciao. Okay, O2 oh. oh, therapy. O2 oh, oh, therapy. The so only you, way. you select the... only two values, FiO2 and, and flow. flow. And flow. The flow must be... Uh, 100. Let's say the minimum could be 50. Let's assume this way, all right? Above 50 is better. You have an advantage. You have a big advantage if you use this system. The noise inside the helmet decreases a lot. When? When you use the ventilator. Especially so the noise using ventilator will be less than using Venturi system? Yes. The big point of the Venturi system is the noise. Yeah. They are noisy. And uh, so if you can provide uh, a turbine that moves here inside to the helmet, the turbine is very quiet. Before you ask, uh, Claudia, how to convince the Russian doctor and nurses to yeah. use the helmet. My solution is take the helmet, put it on your head, close it and stay inside. And you realize when you do something wrong or something right. If you put a, a Venturi system with a too much high flow, 
you see shh, and after a while you you get crazy okay if you do not provide enough flow you feel the breathing of co2 so what to do what if, to do is to provide enough flow that is around 60 80 90 liter as claudia suggested that is not too high does not provide too much noise but provides also a very good clearance of a compromise as always in life in my opinion the uh, a, a flow around 80 90 liter per minute is okay for the vast majority of 80 patients. 80 90 yeah and ear, ear plugs not okay that's a solution you can put also the HME filter in order to uh, reduce the noise uh, and, uh, from the Venturi system. It will be condensation the, uh, of water, no? No, 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 no. Inside the helmet. The, the HME cannot provide uh, humidification in the helmet because the flow in the helmet is only in one direction. Only one direction. So the HME does not provide any humidification. If you put the HME filter here, mm -hmm. here yeah, of course, yeah, uh, it, it will reduce the noise, but it will not provide any humidification because to humidify the flow should go back to the humidifier and then forward, back and forward. Instead, the direction is only one. The HME provides a kind of uh, muffler. Uh, uh, Only noise reduction, nothing more, yeah? Noise reduction, yes. Nothing more. You can put it also on the Venturi system somehow, mm -hmm. where, where the Venturi gets air from the ambient. It will redu reduce a bit the power of the Venturi, but it also will reduce the noise. You can use the earplug for a while, and they are okay. You should avoid a uh, scary surface tube tube you you need tube with a smooth surface in order to avoid turbulence inside the tube of the helmet okay the tube that goes to the helmet this tube here should uh, so to reduce the noise uh, the the solution are smooth tube not too much flow i mean if you go over 100 120 liter they become noisy use the ear plug use the hme filter not as a, as an hme filter but as a just a muffler okay and uh, I put it uh, ideally before the helmet not after now i'm gonna show you why this is a typical setup for a COVID patient, right? Mm -hmm. The helmet, the EPA filter, the PIP valve. If you put the EPA filter that is also an HME and also reduces the noise here, it adds resistance. And when you're adding resistance here, you have a PIP inside the helmet that is, that is higher of the PIP that you suppose to put to give to the patient what's the difference between set peep and uh, peep inside yeah okay this is an helmet CPAP plus an ipa filter 90 liter per minute of flow inside the helmet as you can see here when you don't put any peep you have already four say four five centimeter of water if you put 10 of peep instead you get 15. This is something that we have to keep in mind. And I'm sure that we treated many patients, especially in the, during the first and the second wave, with a PIP higher than we thought, higher than we expected. And maybe this was not a very good idea because those patients sometimes do not like higher people. Did you get my point? You put, hello, there is someone there? Hello? Yeah, it's perfect, very interesting information. Ah. 
So you put ten I totally express in total impressed. You put 10 instead is 15 because mm -hmm. the flow is high. The flow is high, you have the EPA filter. The EPA filter provides adding resistance I see, and I see. then it, the, the PIP goes up. Mm -hmm. The solution is to monitor PIP inside the helmet. If you do it, okay, you select the PIP that you want. But for example, when during the first wave of the pandemia, we didn't have all the helmet with the monitoring of the PIP. And so uh, we had a certainly higher level of PIP. And if you measure, the, you put the manometer in this position after the filter, it gives you a right number here, but not the right number here because there's, there is the resistance of the filter. Did you see the point? Yeah, it's simple. Right? Uh, how to set FIO2? Is it uh, <laughs> with, with, with perfect accuracy? Acceptable accuracy? I don't no, know acceptable. what accuracy. Wow. Well, we use an oximeter on the inspiratory limb, a disposable one that we uh, that we use uh, uh, in, in, in the we put on the inspiratory limb just for a brief monitoring and then we de we we disconnect it and we use it in another patient. You can also trust uh, the PIP FIO2 table or provided by the Venturi system of the of, of of the guy that gives can you we the trust it or the big differences sorry can we trust this uh, table provided by uh, manufacturer or it's yeah, different yeah yeah we can trust them the you, you are absolutely can trust and if you are very very accurate you have also to take it, keep in mind that if you change the pip it changes the fio2 because higher the pip less powerful is the Venturi system but the manufacturer provides you table a different level of PIP so if you apply 10 look at the 10 table and you have a, a very good accuracy very good accuracy it's concerning only helmet and uh, when, or uh, another mask or something else well it, it, it the, if you use a you have to you have to realize this point. So, we have to understand, as Claudia said many times, how the Venturi works. Otherwise, it becomes too complicated. Here, this is the oxygen that drives the Venturi system. This is the Venturi, so the reduction of uh, of the hole and the acceleration of flow. A ambient air comes from here. If you put downward, down flow, downstream, sorry, downstream, downstream to the Venturi, a PIP, it will increase the resistance and it will reduce the amount of air that you get from the ambient. So it will increase slightly slightly the fio2 but what, will mean, what, what i mean for slightly instead of 40 percent you have 45 47 but you decrease I flow deal with you. you decrease flow by this resistance certain yes this is why the fio2 goes up because the flow inside here stay the same let's assume 15 liters but the, the ambient ambient air that goes inside instead of being 90 liter maybe becomes 85 80 and so the fio2 goes up a bit so when we increase peep in the helmet uh, by turning this peep uh, valve so we decrease the flow yeah we decrease the flow and we increase bit, the fio2 a bit a bit nothing dramatical nothing dramatical uh, we decrease the flow 10 15 percent is not crucial and we increase the fio2 
What do you think about high tidal volumes during uh, this uh, ventilation? Is it dangerous, uh, psyllium and something else? Uh, yes. So, uh, I th well, I think Sealy can be uh, a major factor in the evolution of the patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome and also with the COVID patient. Many of you have certainly seen patient coming from home or coming from the general world, not having, not, not having seen any CPAP, pressure support, anything with the pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum, right? You saw that, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, you saw that. This Every is day. silly. This is silly, right? Yeah, of course. This is self-induced lung injury. No machine, no CPAP, no tube. But the patient can destroy his own lungs by itself. So it does exist. Um, and I think uh, we should have, and this is the reason why I do like CPAP and I do not like pressure support for those patients. At worst, CPAP maintain the same tidal volume. But usually, CPAP decreases the tidal volume because it promotes alveolar recruitment. And so CPAP is a safe technique. If you start so pushing air inside the lung, then, and, and besides, I don't see why I should do it. Those patients, they are breathing like hell. They have a CO2 of 30, millimeter of mercury, 28. Why should I push more air inside those lungs? I have to recruit them, not to hyperventilate them. Uh, did you measure at, at tidal expiratory tidal volume in these patients? You ask me and you know already the answer. <laughs> because with the helmet CPAP, so far, so far, we cannot measure the tidal volume neither helmet pap neither helmet pressure support but we are working on it and there are at least a couple of systems that will be provided i think and will be available next year to monitor tidal volume in patient during CPAP, helmet CPAP. how it will be done technically there are two uh, two systems one is in PD, with a Impedance, mm -hmm. and electrical it, it, impedance, it, it, electrical impedance, not the AT, is much easier. Mm -hmm. There is a device that is called Expiron, mm -hmm. uh, something that you should that we are already using and we tested and we studied. It, it is pretty reliable, and you can put on the chest of the patient and give you an estimate. And besides, we are working instead in a in a patent to measure tidal volume using the helmet CPAP. And I think we're gonna finish the job next year. Validation of the results. Can we put inside the mouth mouthpiece uh, and volumeter and measure uh, uh, tidal volume during CPAP or not? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, but it's not certainly practical. practical. But uh, did you measure it? it uh, no, I didn't. Maybe I, I, did it only, I, I did it only for scientific purposes. Mm -hmm. I cannot make no. Uh, I mm, I use a clinical at, at this point. I wanted to measure tidal volume, as I told you. Otherwise, we we, we would not have uh, involved ourselves in a patent. So we are very uh, focused on this issue. Very focused. But so far, uh, I I do follow the pattern of the patient and I am happy when the patient decreases respiratory rate, stop to use accessory muscle. Uh, when the CO2 goes from 28 to 32, I'm very happy, very happy. And instead, uh, if the patient uh, does not do that, I'm a bit concerned on continuing CPAP. I do not use pressure support. Mm -hmm. 
We have in Russia wrong beliefs concerning uh, injurious uh, non-invasive ventilation, CPAP also, and uh, concerning, of course, early intubation in this patient. It saves lives. Okay. Well, uh, I, I cannot answer this question uh, in, a, in a sure or in a, in a... Okay. I don't have a clear answer for that, but... First of all, CPAP, you are referring to those data. Those data were collected by Giacomo Bellani that is working nearby me in a lung safe study. Patient with a PF ratio below 150, when you provide them with non-invasive ventilation, they have a higher mortality compared to the one that goes in invasive mechanical ventilation. Those patients were treated with mask, with mask pressure support. Mask pressure support. This is what happens when you use, when you take a patient in non-invasive ventilation. He starts with a tidal volume of 424. If you put the CPAP, it goes to 400. And if you put the pressure support, it goes to almost 600. Okay? So CPAP does not provide increased tidal volume. Almost never, never. If any, the tidal volume goes down. The evidence, this is the pressure support. This is pressure support. Patient on pressure support, they have tidal volume mask pressure support. Above 10, 12, and above 12 ml per kilograms. Look here. This will not happen on CPAP, never, never. Because it's not boosting the tidal volume. The evidence that CPAP is dangerous does not exist. Those are, those are Italian study on the helmet CPAP in pneumonia, and they compare better to oxygen therapy. This is this is uh, our ICU during COVID. Those are patient, those are DNI patients, do not intubate. So keep in mind, treated with helmet CPAP, obviously only the minority of them did make it. So the mortality is around 70%. DNI, do not intubate order. Okay? Those are full treatment. No DNI, no DNI. Okay, so only CPAP, as you can see, 70% of patient did make it only with CPAP. The remaining 30% were intubated, but the proportion of patient that died were only those 22. So approximately 15%, 1-5, 15% died of the COVID patient going on MSCPAP. Did you follow my reasoning? Hello? Is anybody there? Hello? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> You tired, huh? No, 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 no. It's very, it's very interesting because we know uh, in I Russia only, we don't have, have uh, only, sorry, such have low to do not minutes, intubate patients. I have sorry, I have only five minutes. Otherwise, I will okay. divorce. Okay. Okay. It's 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 uh, very interesting for us because we don't have uh, laws uh, to use DNA in Russia. You don't have what? Don't have laws, such law to use DNI. We cannot ah. uh, use DNI order. Only uh, intubate. It is not a law. Come on, we are a Catholic country. We know exactly what we're talking about. But at the first wave of pandemia, we did not have enough bed. I cannot create bed out of nowhere. So we had to decide. We had to decide. This is not a question of law. Is a question of what 
how many patients you have and how many beds in ICU you have. I see. We, we're talking about patients who uh, had right, right uh, order, do not intubate. Yeah, okay. I understand. We are not USA, remember. We are yeah, yeah, a Catholic yeah. country. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have the Pope inside our country. So even in Italy, do, they do not like it. But the real, be realistic among the doctors. If we have 200 beds and you have 400 patients, even so the Pope will so say, do your best, doctor. I understand. So the order best, comes doctor. from doctor, not from patient, yes? Absolutely. Uh, is, it a, is it triage? Triage the It's triage, I think. Triage, like in war. Yeah, yeah, I see. It's normal. Nothing. And besides, there are patients that they, maybe they are 80, 80 years old. They have comorbidities, a variety scale of six or seven. Come on. And what's the criteria for this day nine? Age, uh, something else? Frailty. Mainly frailty. Frailty, frailty scale. The frailty scale is similar to age. But you, you can be 80 years old or 75 and be very, very fit. Or you can be 62 and be mm -hmm. very frail. I see. So I see. frailty is the, the... And then it depends on the amount of beds that you have. Now, during the fourth wave, we are not in, in much trouble. So we have patient older and frail. But during the first wave in Lombardy, I am in Lombardy. I live in Lombardy. Okay, and I work in Lombardy. We had uh, so many patients. Are you we afraid of lawyers in this situation or not? Was a war. Mm. Was a war. When we're talking about lawyers, I think uh, they don't care. Was it war or not? No, do, no, are you afraid do, of they it? have to care because we are living in a real world, not in paradise. If you have 400 patients and 200 beds, you have to decide. I see. No way. Be, don't, don't be. Uh, we have to be. Anyway, I don't want to talk about any more about this issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. Because it was so very difficult for me also. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's ethical. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Thank you. So we have, uh, I think, uh, not not so plenty of time. Yeah. So we have maybe one or two uh -huh. minutes. Yeah. yeah. I have to go. Remember. You have to go. Yeah, I know. Uh, thank you very much for your. Great, excellent, uh, the best in the world discussion concerning this technique. Uh, I think nobody can do it better than you. Oh, come on. Thank you, thank you. I think that you okay. will uh, will look forward to see you again in our respiratory school. Okay, okay. Nice. It's a, for me, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good time, good Friday evening. Yeah, you Thank too. Do свидания. До свидания, до свидания. Ciao. Ciao. Yes, so now we, we can close the session, I think. And we have some questions uh, from the audience. And uh, to, for, qu 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 one question to Cla Claudia. Uh, the question is... Uh, uh, Thank you for your time and interesting information, Claudia. Tell us, please, do you use antipsychotic drug to your patients? The answer is yes. Um, I I use uh, dexmethadomidine usually, but really rarely because uh, actually, if you keep the patients out from the ICU. And uh, you take off three times a day the helmet for around 15 minutes, 20 minutes to have uh, the um, food, to have uh, lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm, usually, the patients do not have so much problems of the delirium. Uh, it's different if. Uh, um we have uh, episodes of delirium then mm. we uh, use dexedomidine in the ICU in non-invasive ventilation perfect 
So, so it, it makes works. sense uh, the delirium uh, in ICU or outside ICU the different different uh, frequency, yeah? Yes, absolutely. So so when, when 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 we put patients outside ICU we decrease the level of delirium, yeah? Yes. Yes. Perfect. It's it's, it's very you, very good point for our Russian doctors. Yeah, especially if you try to keep them uh, uh, connection with the, I mean, the possibility to telephone to their parents, and this is very helpful for the patient, not to go in complete uh, delirium and. Claudia, do you use mor morphine or something uh, opioids? M morphine, no. Benzodiazepine, low dosage. Or, uh, or if if we move a patient to the ICU because we are um, thinking that he might need uh, uh, intubation, then uh, we use directly the dexedomidine. Morphine, no. Low dosage of benzodiazepine or or Dex. Claudia, we have another question. Yeah. Were, were there in Italy any trials of the treatment that combined non-invasive or CPAP ventilation plus prone positioning over uh, 12 to 16 hours a day with deep sedation? With deep sedation? Yeah, any, any trials with combined non-invasive ventilation, prone position or deep sedation and deep sedation. It's well known that all guidelines recommend against that. Yeah, I agree with the, the recommendation against that, absolutely. And uh, I am used not to prone patients. Mm. And the few studies uh, describing prone position in non-invasive ventilation show a, a, a small advantage uh, during uh, um, during the prone position, but this uh, advantage in uh, saturation uh, uh, goes away immediately as soon as the patient is uh, on the supine position. So I prefer to to make the patient stay a lot sitting out from the bed sorry out from the bed do you hear me yes 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 okay uh, out from the bed sitting on chairs or or or, or uh, on the bed or otherwise with the position that has described has been described by Fofi uh, sitting and uh, with the um, arms lying on the bed. I don't know if it's bad. It's a position in, with his uh, thorax on the bed, but he's sitting on a chair nearby the bed. Without sedation? Yes without sedation. Absolutely. So you don't have trials concerning sedation and the non-invasive ventilation? No. In Italy? No, I, I, no. I am not uh, aware of this. So I think not. Uh, uh, no, no. Okay, the next question. What about to drop down the huge belly of an obese patient? Lying in the prone position between the two high rollers, pillows, and decrease the airway pressure this way. Um, sorry, the question is not clear for me. Uh, uh, put patient uh, on prone position between two pillows, he big big belly between two two pillows okay. to prevent to prevent air uh, pressure pressure swings. Okay. Well, uh, again, I, 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 I have no experience on prone position in non-invasive ventilation, so 
um, because I actually uh, am used to do proposition in invasive uh, ventilation patient and I believe that in, uh, proposition works very well if the patient is deeply sedated and pluralized because in this way really you have uh, a shift uh, using the gravity pressure of all the the, 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 the perfusion and the ventilatory assess, um, assess, um, assess, uh, um, state of the lung. Uh, if the, the patient is awake and it's not polarized obviously, uh, this doesn't, doesn't work, it doesn't work. It can be a temporary, a, a temporary advantage, but it doesn't work as a treatment. Moreover, from proposition has not been so. Uh, we were proning uh, all patients uh, at the beginning, but we didn't have uh, so many advantages in COVID nineteen patients as uh, we have uh, in RDS patients. Mm -hmm. It's not so so useful also in uh, mechanically in, in invasively ventilated patients so. uh, the next question claudia what sort of corticosteroids do you prefer as a pulse therapy for the patient on cpap therapy and what about your favorite dose Mm, corticosteroid has been done. Uh, dose been of done. corticosteroids, and what do you think about six milligrams of dexamethasone? Is it sufficient? Well, uh, we changed uh, many uh, <clears throat> protocols uh, of uh, COVID 19 treatment, but uh, the, um, the corticosteroids uh, are uh, administered before we start non-invasive ventilation and they have no link at all with non-invasive ventilation so we just follow the now we are we are giving very low uh, amount of corticosteroids in the first the two pandemic uh, uh, periods uh, we were giving a lot of corticosteroids to the patient i think six milligrams uh, it's a low dose uh, but it depends also on how many days of treatment to do and, and there is not uh, enough uh, uh, evidence uh, that uh, it's needed, it's really needed. <coughs> do you use more than uh, 6 milligrams of uh, dexamethasone? Uh, no, 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 we do not use more than this, no, no. We were using much more, but one year ago. Right now, no. And if there is no signs, really signs of diffuse, um, uh, diffuse pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia, we also do not administer it. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are disadvantages? Next question. What are disadvantages of a homemade, cost-effective uh, Venturi system assembled from an anesthetic mask on straps, a peep valve, and the colored Venturi valve? I don't know what is it. Uh, homemade, cost-effective Venturi system. What is it, does it does it mean? I don't know, but if you are talking about uh, uh, the Venturi masks for oxygen therapy with the uh, colored uh, valves, uh, um, mm -hmm. not valves, uh, with the colored uh, um, pieces uh, that you put uh, to achieve a certain CO2, those are very good uh, to administer a correct CO2, but they do not uh, accelerate the oxygen flow. So if you put 10 liters at the source, you get 10 liters at the um, in the mask and so, so it's not real venturi so that's not a high flow high flow it's a venturi not high flow that just mixes uh, ambient air to get a certain co2 so forget it to do this to do a 
uh, to think to do a C prop using those. Mm -hmm. if, if the question was this. Thank you. Do we have another question from audience, Robert? Uh, Claudia, we, we don't have any questions. Uh, we thank you for your patience uh, to our pro problematic uh, presentation from time to time. And uh, I hope that you will be with us uh, the next time. Oh, yes, for sure. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me. And. Uh, See you next time. Thank you. Have, have, okay. have a good, uh, uh, how it will be called, uh, Friday or weekend, I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye-bye. Bye. Дорогие -bye. друзья, спасибо за ваше участие в нашей первой школе с иностранными коллегами на не совсем русском языке. И я на самом деле, ну, мы первый, это был наш первый опыт, я прошу прощения у всех за наши накладки, которые были с, с, с техническими особенностями второго канала перевода. Я надеюсь, что к следующей нашей школе, которая состоится с Доминика Люка Грека 24 февраля, у нас эта накладка будет все-таки разрешена, и мы сделаем нормальный такой беспрерывный перевод. Я благодарю за огромную работу, проделанную, конечно, нашими переводчиками, потому что понимаю, что их работа была в два раза труднее, чем работа моя и работа итальянцев наших. Это действительно очень огромный труд, и я приношу им свой просто огромный низкий поклон. Ну и до новых встреч на нашей Рите. Пишите вопросы в наш телеграм-канал, я надеюсь, что мы их осветим, как всегда. Спасибо за ваше участие.